All right, so today we have uh, Peter Nelson is going to be speaking on extensions and co-extensions of cliques. All right, thank you, Rose. Um, I'm gonna try standing up so I make sure the camera's right. Uh, all right, so this is a, yeah, as the title says, this is a talk that's kind of split into two different topics, but they both share a common theme of dealing with matroids that are very close to being complete graphic matroids. So extensions and co-extensions of matroids that just come from complete graphs. Uh, there's a few different projects that have gone into what I'll be talking about. Um, they're with Jorn, who is my postdoc, Shayla, who's my PhD student, and Sophia, who used to be my master's student. Uh, all right. Okay, I've clicked in the wrong place. Here we go. Uh, so the first topic is um, is Ramsey theory. So this is uh, questions where you have some nice object, but then you've got some chaotic extra combinatorial information with that object. And what you'd like to do is to recover a nice sub-object where the combinatorial information is all tame. So of course the classic Ramsey theorem is I have a big complete graph and I color the edges uh, in two colors and I can find a big complete subgraph where all the edges are one color. So we'd like to do that thing for um, matroids that are close to being graphs in a sort of similar way. Now I wanted to introduce this question with the way the way I encountered it, which is by doing things in extremal and structural matroid theory. So when you're doing that kind of stuff, you, you often find a matroid that looks very close to being very nice. So it looks very close to being a predictive geometry or a clique, or in this case, a big complete bipartite graph. But it's, not, it's only there as a minor in your matroid. It's not there as a restriction. And for various technical reasons, what you want is a restriction. You don't want to contract something. So here's a prototypical example of a question like that. Uh, I have a matroid M, and M is a co-extension of a complete bipartite graphic matroid. So M contract F is the cycle matroid of K and N. Uh, so M contract F is these pink elements, and M is kind of obtained by lifting all these elements, and I, I've undone, undone the contraction. And I want to find a nice restriction of the matroid M. Ideally, I'd find a restriction that looks like a complete bipartite graphic matroid itself, but I won't always be able to find that. So the question is, what can I find? What will I guarantee to be able to find in this kind of situation? Uh, now, one could think about this question at a completely matroidal level, but it's not the best idea because we're looking at not just a general matroid, but a matroid that's very close to being a graphic matroid. And thanks to Zaslavsky, we have a beautiful combinatorial way to encode this in terms of just the graph and a small amount of extra information on top of the graph, rather than having to think about the rank axioms in the usual way we do matroid theory. Uh, so this object is a biased graph. So to, to describe a co-extension of the graphic matroid of G, what I can tell you is the graph G together with what's called a bias on G. And a bias is a set B of uh, containing some cycles of G, and those cycles have to <clears throat> obey one particular axiom. These cycles are called the balance cycles. Uh, and that axiom is called the theta property. Uh, the theta property says that whenever you have a theta subgraph of your graph G, which means a pair of distinct vertices and three internally disjoint paths between those vertices, then among the three cycles of the graph that belong to that theta, either zero, one, or three of them are balanced cycles. So zero, one, or three of them belong to B. So the only option we're ruling out there is that the theta contains two balanced cycles and one unbalanced cycle. As long as you have a collection of cycles that obeys this property, then that collection will describe a co-extension of the graphic matroid. And I won't even say how it describes, how it describes it exactly. It suffices to just say that co-extensions of the graphic matroid are in bijection with these biases, consisting of sets of balance cycles obeying the theta property. Now, what's good about this is it allows us to take this abstract matroid question we started with and reduce it to a more concrete question that's really just about graphs. So instead of asking what can we find as a restriction in a co-extension of a complete bar, Matroid, we graph. Interesting subgraphs. 
Now I've hedged on what I mean exactly by interesting here, but that's because I just want to state the theorem to tell you what I mean by interesting. Uh, what we managed to prove is that if I have a huge complete bipartite graph and I have an arbitrary bias on that, then inside it, I'm going to find a big complete bipartite subgraph where one of two things happens. So either all the cycles in that subgraph are balanced or none of them are balanced. And you'll see here, I'm going to use the convention that blue means balanced and pink means unbalanced. So it's nice to be able to do this. If you're looking back at the matroid question, what this tells you is that your original matroid had a big restriction, which was either just a complete bipartite graphic matroid or a free coextension of a bipartite graphic matroid. But uh, I want to talk about how to prove this because um, really I, I think that this is independently interesting. What, what, what do you get when you ask Ramsey type questions for bias graphs? Uh, now, the proof here is, uh, I mean, we're, we're not doing Ramsey theory in the usual way. If we're doing Ramsey theory in the usual way, we take a complete graph and we assign a color to the edges, to each edge of the complete graph. Here, we're kind of assigning a color to the cycles and we're doing it in a way that obeys a certain axiom. So we can't just apply Ramsey theory and be done, but we can actually apply Ramsey theory and that's how we get, how we get to the end here. We apply the usual Ramsey theorem for edge colorings of complete graphs a large number of times. So what do we have? We, we, we have a huge complete bipartite graph with a bias on it. And we want to find a big complete bipartite subgraph where the bias looks really nice, where it's been cleaned up. So either everything's balanced or everything's unbalanced. Now here's a picture of the huge graph I started with. It's actually technically convenient to think of this graph as being huge, but far bigger on the right hand side than on the left. So here we've got KNN, where the left hand side A has size little n, the right hand side B has size big n. A is huge, but B is even bigger. B is enormous even compared to A. And of course we could just take something with both sides enormous and throw away things to get to this. And we wanna clean it up. And to clean it up, we're gonna do it slowly and bit by bit. Um, actually, all I'm gonna show you is how to clean up the four cycles. To do this, we're going to fix a pair on the left hand side, u and v, and we're just going to first clean up the four cycles that go through u and v. Now, a four cycle through u and v is going to contain u and v, and then a pair of vertices on the right, v and v prime, and there's only one four cycle for each such pair. And for each pair on the right, one of two things is going to happen either that four cycle is balanced or it's unbalanced. So here's a picture where you see both types of examples. So I've just told you that B is an enormous set where for every pair of things in B, one of two things happens. Either you get a balanced cycle through U and V and that pair, or you get an unbalanced cycle. So the usual Ramsey theorem tells us that we can find a huge subset of B so that within that subset B1, either every pair gives you a balanced cycle through U and V or every pair gives you an unbalanced cycle through U and V. Now, B1 is much smaller than B. We have to take a log if you're keeping track of the numbers. But if B was enormous, we can still choose B1 to be enormous in some vague sense. Uh, so what this does is it allows you to clean up the right-hand side just solely from the perspective of the vertices U and V on the left and the four cycles through those. So we're not done yet cleaning things up. But we just play this trick again now. So we pick a different pair, say u primed, v primed on the left. And now we look at all the four cycles through u primed and v primed, except we only look inside the subset b1. And inside that subset b1, we can apply Ramsey's theorem again to get a set b2 of size log b1, so that for some other pair on the left, all the four cycles look the same, they're all balanced or all unbalanced. And we're not gonna just do that twice, we're gonna do it for every pair of vertices in A. So we're gonna take a log of the size of the right-hand side, A choose two times, and what we'll get to is a, a set B, A choose two, this is zoomed in a long way, so that for every pair of vertices in A, either all the four cycles through that pair are balanced or all of them are unbalanced. Okay, we're not done yet, we can still have balanced and unbalanced four cycles, but I've just told you that for every pair in A, one of two things happens. So I can now 
apply Ramsey theorem to A and take a log size subset so that the same thing happens for every pair. And if I do that, I'm going to get to a much, much smaller, but still kind of as large as I like, uh, subgraph on A primed and B primed, uh, where either every four cycle in that graph is balanced or every four cycle is unbalanced. So now I've cleaned up all the four cycles at the expense of making things much, much smaller, um, more on one side than the other. Now, you'd like to do this for six cycles, and I, I won't say why just yet, but if you try doing this for six cycles, you'll run into technical issues. There's more than one six cycle on a given six element subset of vertices. So the solution here isn't to apply Ramsey again for a higher version of Ramsey theorem. The solution is to actually look at the theta property and ask what it means for every four cycle to be balanced or every four cycle to be unbalanced. And you can go a long way with that. In fact, you can show rather easily that if you knew that every four cycle was balanced, then every cycle will be balanced. And this just follows from the theta property. Note that we haven't actually used the theta property yet. So we use it here. Uh, here the, the argument is a pretty easy induction. So here is a, a, just one picture basically saying how it works. If I have a six cycle, and I know all the four cycles are balanced, then I can shortcut across the six cycle to make a theta subgraph. This gives me a theta with two four cycles, which are both balanced, so the six cycle was balanced, and induction using the same argument just gives you that every cycle is balanced, and we're using the fact that every cycle is even here. Uh, the second outcome isn't quite as nice. It's not gonna be true that just because all the four cycles are unbalanced, every cycle is unbalanced, but you can show by dividing by a factorial here and there that if all the four cycles are unbalanced, you'll be able to find a large subgraph where every cycle is unbalanced. And that's using a different application of the theta property and the pigeonhole principle, but I won't say more about that. So again, this is what we proved um, in a big complete bipartite graph, you either get one extreme outcome or the other in a large subgraph. And as I said, this is a real question we came across in structural matroid theory, but if you just think that Ramsey questions for bias graphs are interesting. This isn't the first question you'd ask. I mean, Ramsey theory is most natural when you're dealing with a complete graph, not a complete bipartite graph. So a reasonable question is, what do I find inside a huge biased graph where the underlying graph is a clique rather than a complete bipartite graph? Uh, now, I don't, um, <clears throat> well, I guess that a reasonable question to ask is, what outcomes would you expect? And perhaps the most optimistic you could be is to hope that inside a big complete graph and an arbitrary bias, you'll either find a big complete subgraph where everything's balanced or a big one where everything's unbalanced. Uh, and that's actually the level of optimism we started with. It turns out that's not true. And the actual statement that you get when you finally prove something is a little technical and I won't state it on the next slide, but I'll just say the first thing that you try to do and then maybe give an idea about what difficulties arise. So this slide is really kind of an attempted proof. I'm not gonna talk about the whole proof, but just the beginning. So we now have a bias on a huge complete graph. And for various reasons, we're going to want to actually order the vertices in the complete graph. So say that they're just the integers from one to n. Okay, so we want to apply Ramsey theory. And the first thing to look at is the triples. If I have three vertices on a complete graph, there'll be one triangle through those vertices. That triangle will either be balanced or unbalanced. And so I can apply Ramsey's theorem for three element subsets, which works just as well as for two element subsets. And I will find a large subgraph so that either all the triangles are balanced or all of them are unbalanced. Now the first case, actually that's just a win. If you, can, if you have that all the triangles are balanced, you can use almost the same induction I showed you just earlier to conclude that all the cycles are balanced. The second case is not so clear what to do. You don't get an induction off the ground in the same way. Unbalanced cycles are um, less useful than balanced ones. So the next thing to do is say, well, I want to apply Ramsey to four tuples. Now, what would be nice would be if Ramsey told you that each four cycle, either all the four cycles were balanced or all the four cycles were unbalanced in a large subgraph. That's not what it gives you. And the reason for that is that for every four tuple of vertices, there's not one, but three different four cycles that go through that four tuple. 
And conceivably, it could be the case that for every four tuple, some of those three cycles are balanced and some of them aren't. And Ramsey's not gonna get you away from that. That will still be true in every subgraph. So you have to think for a little while to see what Ramsey actually gives you. And for this, it's useful to order the vertices, but uh, this is what you get. So for vertices i, j, k, and l, I'm gonna use the convention here that I'm gonna put the vertices from left to right in increasing order. For vertices i, j, k, and l, there are three different four cycles. There's the one that goes i, j, k, l, and then back to i, then there's i, j, l, k, i, k, j, l. And when you're doing this stuff, these three classes of four cycles, they actually really adopt their own personalities. They, they're not really the same. Once you've fixed an ordering, they behave quite differently. <clears throat> now what Ramsey theorem gives you is that for each of those types of cycles, either they're all balanced or they're all unbalanced. You can think of this as applying Ramsey's theorem for four tuples where you have eight colors for the eight possibilities, or you could think of it as applying Ramsey's theorem three times successively for two colors, but either way you get to this outcome where the triangles are all the same and then for each particular flavor of four cycle, all the four cycles of that type are the same. And this does actually get you off the ground. Well, if you assume things about the balancedness of these cycles, you can start to conclude things about uh, higher structure in the graph and, and in the end, nice structure in, in a subgraph of the graph. But I don't want to go there. And I, I, I still don't want to state where we actually get yet because it wouldn't be natural at this point to say where that is. Uh, instead, I want to do what we really should have done when we tried to start to prove this theorem, which is, to think about what the theorem should say. We were just trying to prove that you're gonna find a big subgraph where everything's balanced or everything's unbalanced. That's not true and, and it's not too hard to come up with examples that show that's not true. Now, just like matrices over fields are a really good way to build matroids and think about how matroids behave in general, the natural way to build lots of bias graphs is to think about uh, a group labeling construction due to Zaslavsky. So the basic game here is that I have a group and I have a graph and I'm going to assign group labels to the edges in that graph. And for our purposes, just think of the group as being a cyclic group and think of the notation as being additive. Right now, what I, would, what I want to say is that if I take a graph and I assign group labels to the edges, then I can get a collection of balanced cycles by saying a cycle is balanced if it sums to zero. Unfortunately, I can't quite say that because there's a technicality about the directions of the edges. So instead, I'm gonna say a uh, cycle is balanced if when you walk around that cycle and you add one, you add the label for every edge where you're moving to the right and subtract the label for every edge where you're moving to the, red, the edge. If I take that sum and that gives me zero, the cycle is balanced, otherwise it's unbalanced. So we've seen this construction both in Nathan's talk and Dylan's talk. It's a very nice way to construct lots of bias graphs. It gives you frame matroids and lift matroids. And it gives us a, a wealth of examples for our purposes here. Now this uh, ugly looking formula is saying what I said, that when you go to the right, you add, and when you go to the left, you subtract, but it's probably easier to look at these two examples. So here I've got these pink group labels on every edge. Um, if I start at the leftmost vertex in the cycle on the left and I go clockwise, I'm going to be adding one and adding three, then subtracting two because I'm moving to the left and subtracting two again. And I do that, I get to zero. That makes the cycle balanced. And the one on the right, on the other hand, I could start at the leftmost vertex and say I walk anti-clockwise and I get one plus one plus one and then minus one because I'm going back to the start, moving leftwards. And that doesn't give me zero, so that would be an unbalanced cycle. Now this, I mean, the sum looked like it depended on the choice of where to start here and also which direction I went. Um, that may affect the sum, but it won't affect whether the sum is equal to zero. So if I start at a different vertex and walk around the cycle in the opposite direction, it won't change whether a cycle is balanced or unbalanced. Uh, now what Zaslavsky showed is that, in fact, this does give you a bias. It gives you a collection of balanced cycles that satisfies the theta property. So whenever you have a graph with a group labeling, you get a biased graph. <clears throat>
Now note that the usual way to talk about this involves a graph with directions on the edges. Um, here we've got implicit directions on the edges because I'm putting the vertices in order. So what I'm saying is equivalent to the usual way of thinking about these labeled graphs. So these labels graphs give us some interesting examples and they, they give us examples that kind of point to what a Ramsey theorem really should say for cliques. The first example is almost the, the, the least creative way to label a graph over a group. Take a cyclic group, so the additive group of the integers or the, the integers mod k, and then take the generator one and assign that to every edge in a complete graph. That will give you a group label graph so it will give rise to a bias, a collection of balanced cycles that obeys the theta property. So it makes sense to ask what happens here. What makes a cycle balanced in this bias? So if I'm walking around the cycle with these labels, all I'm doing is adding one for each edge when I move to the right and subtracting one for each edge when I move to the left. And if you look at examples, you can see that that will make some cycles balanced and others unbalanced. The one on the, the left in this picture, if I start in the leftmost vertex and walk clockwise, I'm moving right, then right, then left, then left, so that will be two minus two is zero, that's gonna be balanced. The one in the middle, uh, if I go again anti-clockwise, I get one plus one plus one minus one is two, so that will be unbalanced unless I'm working in a group where two is equal to zero, so if k is one or two, the middle one will be balanced. And then the third one, if I'm starting on the far left, I'm gonna be going right, then left, then right, then left, so I get a cancellation again, and that will be balanced. So this gives me a bunch of examples. It gives me one for each integer n, as well as one for the, just the group of all integers. And in general, for a large enough complete graph, these different k will give me different examples. Uh, this construction was first described by Matthews, and then Zaslowski later called it poise bias. And so you have poise bias, which is what you get for just the integers, and then you have poise bias modulo k. A couple of things to note here. One is that if I pick k to be one, so I pick the group to be trivial, then this just makes everything balanced. So the example where everything is balanced is an example of poise bias. The second thing to note is that this is genuinely an example where some of the four cycles are balanced and some of them are unbalanced which means if I knew a Ramsey theorem and I applied it to a k-poise bias graph, any subgraph is still gonna look k-poise bias. So any subgraph I go to will still have balanced and unbalanced four cycles. So the, the self-similarity of these graphs implies that these graphs have to be an outcome of any Ramsey statement because any Ramsey statement that didn't have these in the outcome, they will be a counterexample. So this nice class of examples, it tells us what our theorem would have had to have said. <clears throat> Another example that uh, Matthews discovered, this was in the late 70s, and then Zaslowski called it anti-direction bias. Um, this comes from a labeling, I've done it with powers of three, but it, the powers of three are really irrelevant. All I need is a sequence that grows quickly enough, so powers of three will do. The rule for labeling is that I'm gonna label each edge according to its leftmost end smallest end. So all the edges that start at one will get a label of one, all the edges starting at two will get a label of three, then three will get a label of nine, and so on. Okay, this is another group labeling. So what does it mean to be balanced here? Uh, <clears throat> this is kind of interesting. Um, suppose you had a label of 27 in a cycle, and that cycle turned out to be balanced. So the only place the label 27 occurs is at vertex four. And because the cycle was balanced, it meant that you eventually got to zero. But because this sequence is growing so quickly, it will be the case that the labels bigger than 27 won't be any good for canceling out the 27. Every other label will be zero mod 81, so it's not gonna be good for canceling out the 27. And the labels less than 27 are so small that they're also not gonna be useful for canceling out the 27 because they occur at most twice. So the only way I can have a balanced cycle that has a 27 edge is if it has another 27 edge in the opposite direction, which means that in that cycle, the vertex four is visited from the right and then left again, heading to the right. And you can show by essentially that idea that a, a cycle will be balanced with this labeling if and only if its edges 
alternate or oscillate between left and right. So it goes left, right, left, right, left, right. If that happens, then everything will cancel. Otherwise, things won't cancel. And you can see that in our favorite three, four cycles that the leftmost one is unbalanced because, I mean, you can say there's a three in it, which doesn't get canceled out by anything. Um, the middle one's certainly unbalanced, but the rightmost one is balanced because I'm adding one, subtracting three, then adding three, then subtracting one. And, um, this is really a quite special type of cycle. If you were counting cycles of this sort, that would be a very small proportion of all cycles, but there are some balanced cycles in this example. Again, this has to be an outcome of Ramsey theorem. If I go to any subgraph, it will still look like this. There'll still be some balanced and unbalanced four cycles. And in general, still, it'll be true that these oscillating cycles are balanced. Uh, the final example is a, a little bit less scary. This is just the example where every cycle is unbalanced. Now, that obviously satisfies the theta property. The only point of this slide is to show that you can actually do that where your labelings are just in the group of integers. Now, um, it, this, is, this is sort of not too hard to do. There's a ton of ways to do it. Uh, one way to make sure that no cycles are balanced is just if you assign all your labels to be distinct powers of two. Because no sum of one set of powers of two is equal to the sum of another set of powers of two, you're never going to get any cancellation. So everything's unbalanced. This, um, Zaslavsky called it uh, contrabalance. Uh, I like to call this free bias. So these three examples, free bias, anti-direction bias, and k-poise bias, they all have to show up as Ramsey outcomes. Because if you had any theorem which doesn't, didn't find them, then they would give a counterexample. And in fact, that's the theorem we eventually proved. So for any <clears throat> sufficiently large biased graph on the complete graph, you're going to find the still large subgraph that is either free biased, meaning all the cycles are unbalanced, or anti-direction bias, meaning that all the cycles except this very special type of oscillating cycle is balanced. So that's hopefully color-coded by the way I've written that. Or it's poise biased, and that's an example where a cycle's balanced if and only if the number of forward edges is equal to the number of back edges in the group you're working in. And of course, the all-balanced outcome happens when you put k equals 1 there. So this statement is the, the best statement you could hope for, and we actually managed to prove this. Uh, of course, when you're proving this, you're doing all this Ramsey stuff with four cycles, and you have to actually build objects and show that they came from groups in this way. So we managed to prove this before we did the very sensible thing of looking at examples that come from groups. And we discovered these examples and then later found out that they come from groups, which was really the wrong, the wrong way to do things. But you need to do quite a bit of work to get from the Ramsey stuff I showed you at the beginning to getting to this. Uh, now, one of the lemmas that we had to prove there was to recognize when a graph is poise biased. And this turned out to be quite a nice statement. Uh, it's that if you have a bias on a clique where certain types of four cycles are all balanced, in particular the ones that go one, two, four, three, and the ones that go one, four, uh, one, two, four, three, and one, four, two, three, if those are all balanced, you can prove that what you're looking at is a poise bias. So the, the structures of these small balanced four cycles actually propagate throughout the whole graph and force it to just be a poise bias, an example that comes from a group. Uh, except that's not true. It's almost true, except the Hamilton cycles might misbehave. So you're looking at a graph that is poise biased, except the Hamilton cycles can disagree with the poise bias. Now we were doing Ramsey, so that's fine because I can just delete one vertex, there's no Hamilton cycles left, and now I have a poise bias, which is what I was looking for. But this was interesting from another perspective. I mean, when you prove this, you start with this assumption that all the four cycles are balanced, you do induction and you do a bit of work and show that there's actually a group hiding under things, and you show that essentially the four, the the balancedness of these four cycles propagates throughout the entire graph, but it just doesn't quite reach the Hamilton cycles. They're kind of sitting in their own place and they can more or less behave independently of the rest. Um, and it's not quite true, but it's almost true that if I take the poise biased example, I can just pick my favorite collection of Hamilton cycles and just declare them arbitrarily to be balanced or not. And it's not gonna mess with the hypotheses of the lemma, but it will stop me being a poise bias. So this was kind of interesting that there's a lot of wildness hiding in these examples, even though they're very close to being highly structured. 
Now at this time it was very lucky because uh, Jorn showed up in Waterloo as my postdoc and Jorn is very good at dealing with wild objects and counting things. Um, uh, he'd just been working on very general nature accounting questions with Rudy and I, I thought that this was a very good question. I mean, if Hamilton cycles can behave independently, then among other things, this means there are a lot of biases on the complete graph. There's kind of one for each subset of the Hamilton cycles, more or less. So it seemed natural to go the, <clears throat> uh, a different question from the Ramsey question, instead looking at an enumeration question. So the question is, how many bias graphs are there? Right click. And this is really the, the second half of my talk. Uh, if you're interested in matroid enumeration questions more than counting bias graphs, then of course what I'm asking is how many matroids are extensions of a complete graphic matroid? I'm also asking how many frame matroids come from the complete graphic matroid because they're also encoded by biases. So I think this is a, a reasonable question. Uh, to answer this, there's a, a useful piece of terminology describing a certain type of bias, which we call scarce. So a bias needs to just satisfy the theta property. For every theta, you have zero, one, or three cycles that belong to the bias. A bias is scarce if you never have three. So a bias is scarce if for every theta subgraph, you get at most one cycle that belongs to the bias. An example of a scarce bias is the collection of Hamilton cycles. And that just follows from, well, all it's saying is that in a theta, you're not gonna have two or three Hamilton cycles. So if you think about a theta that contains a Hamilton cycle in a simple graph, one of the paths must have length one, and that will cut the Hamilton cycle into two smaller cycles. You just can't have a theta with three Hamilton cycles, or even two, and it follows that, therefore, the Hamilton cycles form a scarce bias. They satisfy this stronger theta property. Why do we like scarce biases? Well, biases are not closed undertaking subsets. If I take a subset of a bias, it might no longer be a bias because maybe I had a theta that contained three balanced cycles and I killed one of them, and now I'm violating the theta property. But scarce biases are closed under taking subsets. If I have at most one balanced cycle in each theta, the same is still true if I declare a subset of the cycles to be balanced. So when I have a scarce bias, that gives me a lot of biases. That gives me two to the power of the size of that scarce bias number of biases. What do I have in a clique? I told you that <clears throat> the Hamilton cycles form a scarce bias. And therefore, the number of biases on a clique is at least two to the power of the number of Hamilton cycles. So that's two to the half n minus one factorial, or roughly two to the two to the n log n. That's really big. I mean, that's, that's doubly exponential. That's something like the number of matroids. Now, you have to be careful. There are Two, at most two to the two to the n matroids on n elements, and that's sort of about right in some sense. Um, here we don't have a matroid on n elements, we have a matroid on n choose two elements. So this means that these co-extensions of cliques, they give you something like two to the two to the square root of the ground set size number of elements. So it's a lot less than the number of matroids, but in some sense it's still staggeringly large. It's saying that even if I tell you that a matroid is one contraction away from being the cycle matroid of a complete graph, there's still doubly exponentially many examples like that. And it really is a testament to how readily matroids will misbehave, especially when you're counting them. So there are a lot of biases of a complete graph. And so as I said, I started talking to Yohan about this and in the end we, uh, we proved something. Um, and I was quite surprised by this statement. It turns out that this estimate, I've just told you a lower bound for the number of biases. We proved that that lower bound is, is in some sense more or less right. So we showed that now there's three inequalities here. The first two are trivial. So the number of scarce biases is at least two to the one half n minus one factorial by what I showed you. Certainly that's at most the number of biases. The non-trivial part is the last inequality which says the number of biases is at most two to the power of, well, it's at most the lower bound to the power of one plus little over one. So another way of saying this is when you take a log, all these four things are asymptotic to each other. This certainly doesn't mean that almost all biases are scarce biases or anything like that, because the one plus little over one factor on the non-log scale can hide many sins. But 
this is sort of saying that on the log scale, scarce biases are extremely good approximations for biases. The number of scarce biases and the number of biases are very similar to each other. And in fact, they're sandwiched between these two bounds. So the, this very trivial lower bound for how many scarce biases there are was not so far from being, being the right answer. Uh, to prove this, we needed to do two things. Uh, the first is we needed to show that the number of biases is not that much bigger than the number of scarce biases, where what I mean by that is that they're asymptotic on the log scale. And when you're counting things, to show there aren't so many of something, a good way to do that is to show that you can describe that thing with a limited amount of information. So here it's what we needed to do is to show that you can describe a bias by giving a scarce bias and then giving a little bit more information. Now I phrase this as an injection. So this uh, statement says that there is an injection <clears throat> from the set of biases to the set of scarce biases, Cartesian product, a set which you want to think of as small. So it's the set of sets of cycles in a complete graph whose length is at most two thirds n. Right, so suppose you knew that this injection existed. Well, this means that the size of the domain is at most the size of the codomain. So it means the number of biases is at most the number of scarce biases times the number of sets of small cycles. So two to the power of the number of cycles of size at most two thirds n. It's an easy counting thing to show that the number of cycles of size at most two thirds n is way less than the number of Hamilton cycles. So this tells you the number of biases is at most the number of scarce biases times something which is on the scale we care about negligible. Right, so the second term in the chain of inequalities, the third term in the chain of inequalities is not much bigger than the second term. In other words, the middle inequality is sort of not too far from being tight. So this is what this is showing. Now, how do you actually do this injection? Uh, <clears throat> I won't prove that it works, but I can tell you what it is. So I want a way of mapping an arbitrary bias to a scarce bias together with a set of small cycles. All I'm gonna do is that that set of small cycles is just gonna be the set of small cycles that appeared in my bias B, right? So I'm, I'm thinking of a bias B, which I'm not gonna tell you, but I'm gonna tell you what all the small cycles in B were. And then I'm gonna construct a scarce bias from B by making sure there's no thetas that contain three balanced cycles anymore. So for each theta containing three balanced cycles, I'm going to remove, declare the smallest and largest cycle in that theta to be unbalanced now. So this is a way of turning a bias into a scarce bias. And what you have to show is that if I turn a bias into a scarce bias in this way, and I also tell you what all the small cycles were, then you can recover which bias I started with. Why has two thirds come up? It's just because in every theta in a graph on n vertices, the smaller cycle has length the most two thirds n. I think it actually might be two thirds n plus two, but it's something like that. Um, and so this gives you a way to, of describing an arbitrary bias in terms of a small bias and a little bit more information, which gives you that this middle inequality is no, not so far from being tight. <clears throat> uh, the next thing we show is that in fact, the Second, the first inequality is not so far from being tight. So the number of scarce biases is not much bigger than this trivial lower bound. How do we do that? Well, the, the trick is to use a very powerful uh, technique for bounding the number of stable sets in a large graph. And this is the container method, which is due to Bellog et al. and Saxton Thomason. Uh, and this technique, the containers method, allows you to show that in a certain graph, the number of stable sets in that graph is not much bigger than two to the power of the size of the largest stable set. So to encode this question in those terms, we need a graph whose stable sets are the scarce biases, but that's not too hard because a scarce bias is defined to be something where at most one of something happens and that, that kind of looks like a stable set. So what you have to do is build an auxiliary graph whose vertices are the cycles of Kn, in which two vertices are adjacent if those cycles belong to a common theta. Then in that auxiliary graph, the stable sets are the scarce biases, and then we kind of turn the crank on a, a complicated but predictable method to uh, 
up or down the number of stable sets in that, and that will give us this almost matching up or down for the number of scarce biases. So we've shown using these two tricks that the middle inequality is not wrong by that much, the, the second inequality is not wrong by that much, and it follows that you get this chain of inequalities because you have this fudge factor with the little o of one. Um, now, something about this statement which I really liked was its similarity to something that happens in general matroid enumeration. So instead of counting biases, let's say we're counting matroids on n elements. Um, <clears throat> there's a very important class of matroids for these enumeration questions called the sparse paving matroids. Uh, one way to define them is saying a, matro a rank R matroid is sparse paving if for each R minus one element set in the matroid, the number of dependent R element sets that, is con that set is contained in is at most one. Very informally, this is saying that the matroid has tons and tons of bases and almost no non-bases. Non-bases are, uh, are very rare, which is where the word sparse comes from. Uh, <clears throat> now, sparse paving matroids come up in enumeration because they are a good approximation for matroids on the log scale. So Jorn and Rudy proved this amazing result that the number of sparse paving matroids, certainly it's at most the number of matroids, but it's not much smaller than the number of matroids. So the number of matroids on the elements is at most the number of sparse paving matroids to a one plus little over one factor. So they're asymptotic in the log. And I mean, they don't have a matching up or down, that's still open, but it's very similar to the statement above that just like scarce biases are a good approximation for biases on the log scale, sparse paving matroids are a good approximation for matroids. And if you look at the definitions of scarce and sparse, then you'll see there's some similarities. Sparse Sparseness means that in the neighborhood of each R minus one element set, there's at most one non-basis. Scarceness means that in each theta, there's at most one balance cycle. And those, those, are, those kind of feel very similar. So I think it's not a coincidence that you have this common behavior. Yorn and Rudy's theorem is much, much harder to prove than ours. Um, uh, they did a lot more work, but it amounts to a, a kind of a compact description of matroids in terms of sparse paving matroids. Now, everything I've said so far is about biases, in other words, co-extensions of a complete graphic matroid. Um, I don't know about you, I, I find it much easier to think about extensions of a matroid than co-extensions, just in terms of geometric intuition. Somehow they're dual, so it should be as easy as to think about one as the other, but a co-extension, I'm perturbing everything in a matroid in the geometric picture. An extension, I'm just adding one element. So co-extensions are natural because they correspond to biases, which are quite well studied, but it, in some, on some level, it makes more sense to just ask, what about counting or doing Ramsey theory for extensions of Kn? So to do this, we need a combinatorial gadget that's analogous to a bias graph that instead describes extensions, not co-extensions. And thanks to Henry Crapo, we have a very general theorem that tells you how to describe an extension of an arbitrary matroid in terms of some, some combinatorial decoration on the top of the matroid. And when you specialize that to co-graphic matroids, what you get is the theta property. So that describes extensions of co-graphic matroids or co-extensions of graphic matroids, which is what I've been talking about. If you specialize it to the cycle matroid of a complete graph, you get something which is, I'm also gonna call a bias, and it kind of has a similar flavor, but it's not, it's not the same object. It's not a collection of circuits anymore. And it really is just an exercise. You read Henry's theorem about linear subclasses describing extensions of matroids. You ask what that's actually saying for a complete graphic matroid, and here's what you get. So an extension of Kn is gonna be encoded by, again, I'll call it a bias, it's a collection of unordered, non-trivial bipartitions of the vertex set. These are matroidal hyperplanes, by the way, but I won't describe it that way. So it's a collection of non-trivial bipartitions of the vertex set. And instead of satisfying the theta property, they have to satisfy what I will call the tripartition property. And that says that for every non-trivial tripartition of the vertex set, of the three refinements of that tripartition to a bipartition, and most, uh, either zero, one, or three of them belongs to the set B. 
I mean, this looks like the theta property, and it's because they're both special cases of the uh, theorem about single element extensions, but it's kind of, this is a more concrete object, um, and it's the right object to think about when you're encoding extensions of cliques. Uh, now, we have a bias, and so we can talk about a scarce bias, and it's equally useful for constructing lots of examples. So a, a bias is scarce if this intersection never has size three, so it has size at most one. And it's still true that every bias will give rise to an extension, every scarce bias will give rise to an extension, and for every scarce bias, all its subsets also give rise to extensions. So if we can come up with a huge scarce bias, we've got a lot of extensions of Km, and the natural huge scarce bias, remember it was the collection of all Hamilton cycles, in the dual setting. Here, the right thing turns out to be the balanced bipartition. So pretend n is even, it's the set of bipartitions with both sides equal size. You can show that that satisfies the strong tripartition property. It's still scarce because if I have a tripartition, there's at most one way to refine it to get a bipartition. And how many such bipartitions are there? Well, I'm looking at unordered objects. So it's n choose n over two divided by two. That's how many balanced bipartitions there are. That goes up in the exponent when I'm counting. Now, as nice and symmetric as unordered bipartitions are, obviously when you're actually proving stuff, you want to talk about sets. So you, you fix a point and then you encode the bipartitions with sets. If you do that, then you find out that scarce, bipart scarce biases correspond to intersecting antichains in the Boolean lattice. So they correspond to collections of sets where none is contained in another and uh, no two are disjoint. That's the same as a scarce bias when you encode things correctly. All right, so with uh, Jorn and Shayla more recently, this is a, still a work in progress, we've shown that you get the same chain of sandwich inequalities. The number of scarce extensions of Kn is obviously at least two to the number of balanced bipartitions, and it's obviously at most number of extensions, but you get this matching up and down, which on the log scale is asymptotic to the lower bound. So the just like sparse paving matroids are a good approximation for matroids, scarce biases are a good approximation for biases, scarce extensions are a good, are a good approximation for extensions. And we're dealing with sets and partitions now, not dealing with cycles, so we can't use the same techniques, but the proof, the, the proof is unmistakably similar to what, what worked for the dual case. So uh, one of the steps was to count the scarce extensions, to do that in the dual setting, Jorn and I had to do a lot of work in this auxiliary graph. Luckily, because scarce extensions are encoded by intersecting antichains, this work has been done for us. So Kleitman proved the number of scarce extensions is at most this upper bound. And then we have to do this kind of compact description, which says the number of biases isn't much more than the number of scarce biases. And to do that, you need to figure out a way of describing a bias in terms of the scarce bias together with a small amount of extra information, which in this setting turns out to be the set of all things of size, um, a collection of sets of si sets of size at most n over three. So that's tiny compared to the number of sets in total, so that will do the trick. Oh, okay, so I, it, it's nice that, I mean, even though these questions are closely related, they're duals to each other in matroids, you can't just use the same techniques to prove them both. And I have no idea what a general result would be that would imply something about co-extensions of cliques and extensions of cliques simultaneously, but it seems that there's something here. You get the same theorem twice and with uh, quite different flavor. Um, so I don't know what the right conjecture is now, but I want to have a shot at doing some kind of meta conjecture. Um, so you have to figure out what, what you want to do. So say we're doing co-extensions of arbitrary matroids, I need an object, a combinatorial object that encodes that, and Henry Crapo gives that to us, so we can uh, encode general co-extensions in terms of certain collections of circuits. And you have to think about what scarcity would mean, and what you get is that a collection of circuits of a matroid M is scarce if each connected co-rank two restriction of the matroid contains the most one circuit in the collection. So if you specialize that definition to co-graphs, you get the theta property, if you specialize it to graphs, you get the tripartition property. So this should be what happens in general. And the, the meta conjecture would be that if you have a matroid which is sufficiently nice, whatever that means, 
then the number of co-extensions of the matroid is going to be on the log scale, just the trivial lower bound, which is two to the power of the largest scarce bias to the power of one plus the low of one. All right, the little o there should be kind of growing as the size of m grows. So when I say highly structured, I probably really mean a class of matroids or something similar. What I've done shows that this is true. What I've talked about shows that this is true for m of kn and the dual of m of kn. So these are both examples of highly structured matroids where this theorem is true. It's false for the dual of a projected geometry, but that's not so scary because the largest scarce bias in that case turns out to have size one because everything's modular. Uh, so there's probably some kind of non-degeneracy condition. Of course, I've phrased the theorem in a way where you, there's no counterexample because if you give me something that you think is a counterexample, I can tell you it's not highly structured. So I'm gonna say that the dual of a projective geometry is not highly structured. The natural things to look at are things like <clears throat> Dowling matroids over finite groups and also primal predictive geometries where I don't know what happens. Uh, hopefully they will behave nicely in the way that this meta conjecture would suggest and uh, hopefully there's some um, underlying theorem lurking behind everything but I, I don't know even what that would look like. All right, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Can we uh, all unmute and give Peter some applause? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so do we have any questions? You can just uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. Um, or uh, Gary Toft, is that a uh, raise hand? Oh, sorry, no, that was just typing. Oh, all right. Sorry, let me... Uh, Uh, sorry, Rudy, was that you? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, we had some sound going on. I was trying to figure out where that's coming from, but I think that we're good now. I might have muted a couple of people who uh, that wasn't coming from, though. Uh, okay. Peter, I wanted to ask a question. You mentioned that you looked at this problem for complete bipartite graphs first. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain how that came up. Uh, that comes up because if I have a dense graph, I don't get a big sum. So if I have a graph that say has n squared over 1000 edges, I'm not going to necessarily find a large clique in that, but by the Edish Stone theorem, I will find a complete bipartite graph. So when I'm applying structure theory, I've got some dense graph like thing and the unavoidable object in that is a complete bipartite graph, and then that appears as a minor in the matroid, which is how I get to the question. So the answer to the Erdstein mm -hmm. theorem is because complete bipartite graphs are themselves unavoidable restrictions of something else. Right, right. Gotcha. Um, all right. I have a very vague me... question, if I can. Good. Um, so with lifts of graphic matroids, you've got these frame matroids that they're both described by bias graphs. Mm -hmm. Have you tried thinking of taking your sort of biases for projections of graphic matroids and seeing if there's another minor closed class that's very closely related to projections? I haven't. I mean, that sounds like it would be that would be a very interesting class of objects and I, that, that question hasn't occurred to me. I, I'm inclined to be pessimistic and say that couldn't possibly exist, but... Yeah, me too, because otherwise we'd know them. I mean, <laughs> like, like it's, it's, it's worth looking into. Matroids you're just going to have to know about, right, in the, in the world, and it would be amazing if there was another class out there that were like those, but not that many people have sort of thought about the bio, the sort of the structure of projections of graphic matroids, and you're probably the person who understands that the best, so it would be <laughs> worth, definitely worth thinking about a bit. You can look at the way those other two classes differ from each other and see whether there might be an analogous change you can do. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you again, Peter. Let me go ahead and uh, stop the recording.